Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. John Stuart Mill begins his work on liberty by specifying that he's not going to be discussing the liberty or freedom of the will, which is a metaphysical doctrine, but rather something that falls within the domain of social and political philosophy, what he's calling civil or social liberty, the liberty or freedom of an individual within a society to do certain things, do being understood in a very broad sense. And a little ways in, he's going to clarify what he means by talking about the different types and areas of liberty. So he talks first about there being a sphere of action in which society as distinguished from the individual has, if any, only an indirect interest. So what does that mean, having an indirect interest? Society itself is not acting. It's uh, the individuals who are involved, who are doing things. And society does not have a direct interest, as it would be, say, for example, in compelling somebody to give testimony in a law case or keeping people from burning their neighbor's houses down. It has only an indirect interest. That is, perhaps it could affect others within society, or perhaps it, it might not. So he says that comprehending all of that portion of a person's life and conduct, which affects only him or herself, or if it affects others, because it could affect other people, only with their free, voluntary, and undeceived consent and participation. And he clarifies, he says, when I say only himself, I mean directly. And in the first instance, for whatever affects oneself may affect others through oneself. You know, if I take drugs, for example, and it affects my mood, and then I don't follow through on commitments that I've made to others, we could say that they are indirectly affected by that. But they're not directly affected by it by, say, getting high from the, the drugs. So he says... Um, this is the appropriate region of human liberty, all of this sphere of action. Then he goes and he breaks it down into three different domains, which are going to be discussed through the rest of the work in considerable detail. There is the inward domain of consciousness. We could call this you know, freedom of thought or however you want to frame it. Then there's the entire domain of what we can call today lifestyle, and then finally what he calls combination of individuals. So we should look at each of these in turn. He says the first domain is the inward domain of consciousness, which demands liberty of conscience in the, uh, he says, most comprehensive sense. So what is liberty of conscience? Liberty of conscience is not just the, you know, having a conscience and being able to listen to that, you know, however we conceive of it, still small voice or the angel on the shoulder, whatever uh, imaginary thing that you have for construing what conscience is. Traditionally understood, conscience is a sort of, you know, the self telling itself, this is right, this is wrong. It could be properly formed. So it actually gives correct answers. It could be improperly formed. But the idea is that it's better for us to listen to whatever those, those, you know, practical reasoning resources we have inside than not to do so. And the, you know, discussion of this goes all the way back quite a ways into philosophy. And so liberty of conscience in the, the, you know, broadest extent is important. And then he says freedom of opinion and freedom of, um, 
uh, here's his liberty of thought and feeling, absolute freedom of opinion and sentiment on all subjects, practical or speculative, scientific, moral, or theological. So let's think about this. He uses the terms thought and then opinion. So the things that we, we actually think. We should be free in the things that we actually do think. And we should be free in the thinking that we do with them, the thought processes that we have. The formation of our opinions. If we want to read garbage books and, you know, watch uh, true crime TV and get the idea because of that, that the world is much more dangerous than it is. Mill says that, you know, unless it's actually affecting other people, we should be allowed to have that freedom to, to think crazy thoughts about, you know, how likely it is that somebody's going to break into our house and destroy everything or rape us or kill us. Uh, and ignore the things that are much more likely to injure us, like, say, car crashes. Um, now, sentiment, sentiment and feeling. This is where Mill is saying that we should be allowed freedom, provided it's not affecting other people in a direct way against their interests, that we should be free to feel how we want to feel. So, you know, let's take a very silly example. If I don't like broccoli and you do, I mean, it's more likely that's the opposite of the case because I actually do like broccoli and many people don't, then you shouldn't compel me to somehow like broccoli. You shouldn't uh, bring coercive power to bear on me so that I have to deny my own sentiments about that. And when we get to other things, other feelings, Mill is saying we should have freedom. And he says, on all subjects, all subjects, practical, the day-to-day -day things, how we ought to behave, and speculative, whether the moon actually is real or not, you know, conspiracy theories about moon landings and things like that. Uh, Mill is saying we should have freedom of, of opinion and sentiment on those matters. Scientific, moral, theological, all of those sorts of things. And then he says that, in this inward domain of consciousness, we also should include liberty of something that seems to go outside of that domain and get into the rest of the world. He says that the liberty of expressing and publishing opinions may seem to fall under a different principle. Why would it fall under a different principle? Because it seems to be external. But according to Mill, he says... Um, being almost as, of as much importance as the liberty of thought itself and resting in great part on the same reasons, it is practically inseparable from it. So our freedom of expression, which is really the thing that I think people go to this book for the most, falls within this first domain of freedom of thought and feeling. Going along with the freedom of being able to think and feel goes the freedom to express our thoughts and feelings and even publish them. The second big domain that he's going to talk about, which he treats in a separate chapter, is that of what we nowadays call lifestyle. He says, Secondly, the principle, what is the harm, the principle here? The harm principle requires liberty of tastes and pursuits of framing the plan of our life to suit our own character of doing as we like subject to such consequences as may follow without impediment from our fellow creatures. So long as what we do does not harm them, even though they should think our conduct foolish, perverse, or wrong. So if I want to spend my available money and let's say there's not, you know, very much of it, just enough basically to, you know, cover rent and insurance and food and, you know, save up a little bit for medical rainy days and things like that. If I want to use the spare income that I have for, you know, buying video games or giving it to the poor or giving it to somebody who's much richer than I am, uh, in a rather, you know, sort of perverse line of reasoning. Um, all of that is perfectly fine as far as Mill is concerned, and nobody should be impinging upon that. If I'm into, you know, 
metal and I say, well, I'm only going to listen to stuff from the 1970s and 80s with rare exceptions. And somebody else comes along and says, oh, but the really wonderful stuff has been happening from 2000 on. You must listen to that. I'm perfectly fine, according to Mill, and saying, nope, I choose not to. And you can't compel me to do that. Uh, if I if I want to appreciate, you know, uh, cereal boxes instead of fine art, that's perfectly fine as well. It's up to me to form my own tastes and pursue the course of life that I want to do. Um, you know, again, we could look at instances where it starts to bleed over into other matters. If I want to, uh, you know, take baths every single day and a shower in the morning and scrub my hands, you know, for two minutes every time that I do anything in the bathroom, whether it's going to the bathroom or brushing my teeth or even walking in the door and checking how my, my hair looks or something like that, that's up to me. So long as I'm not actually affecting other people, like using too much water or something like that, you know, in an unjust way. Um, if I don't want to bathe at all, well, you know, until that becomes an actual problem for other people, that's within the scope of this, this second domain. So, you know, what we have as hobbies or fandom or allegiances, what sports we watch or don't watch, all of that falls under this domain of lifestyles, whether we're consumerists or anti-consumerists, anything along those sorts of lines. The third thing he says is that there's also a liberty within the same limits of combination among individuals, getting together with others into associations, into groups into organizations, joining organizations that already exist, founding new ones. He calls this the freedom to unite for any purpose not involving harm to others. The person's combining being supposed to be a full age and not forced or deceived. So this, you know, we, we probably would have to exclude some things from that. Uh, for example, many multi-level marketing, you know, associations that people would join uh, where they're not quite sure what they're getting into and it's been sold to them in a deceptive way. Okay, that would not fall under this, but getting together with a bunch of friends to play Pinochle on Sunday nights and taking a collection so that you can have chips and beer and, um, I don't know, watch again, true crime shows on TV or something like that, perfectly fine. Uh, and nobody should interfere with that, provided your association is not interfering with other people. You know, if you're going to insist on doing your pinochle games in, I don't know, say the, the city hall after the city hall is closed or a public library, they would be perfectly, you know, uh, fine in saying, no, no, you can't break in and do that. But, you know, if you're doing it in, in your own home or some other establishment and you're not, you know, actually disturbing in any major way other people, you're not transgressing their rights, that would be perfectly fine. So we have here a pretty extensive conception of what the domains of liberty would be. There's, you know, the sphere of action in which society has only an indirect interest. And the book is really structured along the lines of considering each of these in turn. 